Right, it is the fifth week in our series on old school families, old school families, um, and uh, we're, we're going to discuss something this week that I think is uh, pertinent, I think it's, a, I think it's, it's relevant to our, our life today, uh, if I sound like a, an old person sort of shaking my fist at society, I'm sorry, that's not what I intend uh, this week. Um, but I am going to get a little bit like that, I think, probably. Um, but uh, I, I want us to, <clears throat> to look at a- another fire quencher in the family. Okay? Those of you who have raised kids, you'll probably recognize this. Uh, those of you who are in a uh, relationship, maybe you are married now, um, and you have, uh, you know, maybe you don't have kids, but maybe you found that technology uh, makes things a struggle in your family. How many times uh, have you gone out to eat and witnessed uh, a couple sitting at the table and they're not talking and they're both looking at their phones? Okay, uh, this is not just uh, an issue for young people. In fact, uh, the people that I see glued to their glued to technology more than anybody today is older people. Uh, just, uh, you know, like every old person I know can't get off Facebook and is obsessed with Candy Crush. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, like, uh, I, I, it's not just a young person's thing anymore. Um, technology has become something that's accessible for all. Uh, and so I, I want to talk today uh, about how uh, when we go real old school, and we go back to the Bible, uh, we will find warnings that technology can be a dangerous thing. It can be a fire quencher. It can be a fire quencher. And certainly in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships with others, it can be a big problem. So I want to start out by giving you a theology of technology, a theology of technology. The definition uh, that that I'm going with today uh, for technology is uh, manipulating, utilizing, and creating with God's resources. That's what technology is when you boil it down. Okay, it doesn't have to have, uh, technology doesn't have to have circuit boards, it doesn't have to be electronic, uh, anything that, uh, that manipulates, utilizes, and creates from God's resources can be technology. When you think about uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that information is spread today, and you think about that, the history of that, throughout time, the way that information has been spread throughout time. You know, back uh, thousands of years ago, if you wanted to uh, spread the word about something, you had to walk or ride some sort of mount, a donkey or a horse. Uh, then the, the, the chariot was invented, the wheel was invented. Uh, and then, uh, you know, later on, years later, uh, the, the locomotive was invented. And, and uh, even, even further, later on, the, the car was invented, and then the airplane. And, and who knows what's going to be the future. And now, uh, you can spread information without even uh, moving. You can spread information over the Internet. Technology is utilizing the resources that God put in our world and God put within us, in our brains, that is technology. Anytime that happens, that's technology. God made man out of mud and woman out of a rib. He placed them in a paradise and He told them to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion over the earth. Now, that's dominion over themselves, That's dominion over the animals, but that's also dominion over the resources of the earth. To have dominion and to rule over it and to take care of it. He built this garden at the beginning and at the end of God's story, His dwelling place with man is pictured as a vast city. Started out in a garden 
And at the end, it's pictured as a vast city. God intended man to manipulate, utilize, and create beauty and goodness in this world. He intended us to make technology and for it to be good and lovely and helpful. And so today we find ourselves east of Eden, but west of this city, this new heavens and new earth, this city that we read about in Revelation. But what is the story of technology in our world from God's perspective? Does He view it as a bad thing, as an evil thing? Well, no, not necessarily. One of the most God-like things that we can do is use the resources we have at our disposal to make things better. In fact, Jesus was raised in a family of what? What was the trade of his family that he was raised in? Carpenters. Now, uh, the, we have the English translation carpenter. The Greek word is not so specific. Many people believe that Jesus' family was more likely stonemasons than they were, um, they were carpenters because there wasn't much wood in Palestine during that day. I mean, there were some. But uh, you read about the trees in the Bible. Uh, where did they have to, go, have to go get the wood for the temple? Had to go to Lebanon, okay? Um, in, in Palestine, you got sycamore trees. Uh, you got mustard bushes. <laughs> you, you don't have a whole lot of wood, okay? The word that's used there for carpenter is actually the word tectone, okay? Or a word from which we get technology, now, later on, Paul, the Apostle Paul, refers to himself as a master carpenter or a master builder. That word is architectone or architect. Okay? That is, uh, those are words that are used in our, our New Testament. They're used in our Bible. Technology is something uh, that God expected. It's something that He wanted. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it was intended to have good uses. God intended for mankind to have dominion over the earth and use the resources that He gave us, use them in a responsible way, in a good way, in a godly way. God wanted us to make technology. In fact, Technology pushes back the results of the fall. The fall of Genesis chapter 3, technology helps push those things back. You know, back in the day uh, when you had weeds in your garden, which is a result of the, full, of the fall, Genesis chapter 3 tells us that, uh, you, you only had a few options. You could dig up the weeds, but now we got a, a few more options. Okay? Back in the day when you talked about gardening and you talked about planting and, and uh, the Bible says that, that Adam and his descendants would have to work by the sweat of their brow. They would, have to, they would have to plant and work to plant. And now, today, we have uh, gardening tools. We have tractors that run on GPS that don't even need a person to drive them sometimes. Technology helps push back the results of the fall. It is not necessarily a bad thing. So I don't want you to get the idea that I'm standing up here saying that we need to go back to the Stone Age and that we don't need to use technology and that that's a bad thing and that if you enjoy Candy Crush Saga and you're addicted to it, that, that's, uh, that you're wrong for, for that. That's okay. I mean, I, you know, technology is okay. It can be a good thing. But technology can also be utilized for evil and ungodly purposes. Or it can be utilized for neutral purposes that aren't really good, but they aren't really bad. And that can become a distraction and a fire quencher as well. So I want us to kind of go through the Bible and talk about technology a little bit. And I want to give you, first of all, an example, an example of technology gone wrong. Now, this process of technology going wrong started in the Garden of Eden. It started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve did not utilize God's creation respectively or effectively. They tried to use God's resources in a way that they weren't supposed to be used. Okay? The, the 
tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they misused that tree. They misused it. They used it for their own evil purposes. And that started a long line of people using God's resources for evil purposes, which is a bad use of technology. This sort of culminates and becomes a a big, a very large thing at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. This continues, it grows and it grows and it grows until we come to Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. The mis- This misuse of God's creation spiraled out of control until mankind hit rock bottom at Babel. They defiantly decided that they were going to build a city, a tower, a society without God and without His blessing. That is the problem with the Tower of Babel. It was an intentional decision to do it without God. That is what happens when mankind tries to build its kingdoms without God. In fact, Babel, the Tower of Babel, is known later on, that that instance is known later on in the Scriptures as Babylon. And Babylon serves as an archetype for all human nations, all of them being attempts to do things without God to do things outside of God. And so they used the technology, this great and fancy technology. You're going to be so shocked about the technology that they used at the Tower of Babel. It it was a fantastic and new technology. You know what it was? The brick. Okay? The brick. They used the technology of the brick to snub their noses at God, and God responded by reaching down to confuse and scatter them. He confused their language at Babel. And so this use of technology at Babel marks uh, the, the point at which mankind really, I mean, they went off the rails at Genesis chapter 3, but, but at Babel, at Genesis chapter 11, it was solidified. Mankind has gone off the rails. Now, interestingly enough, Our Lord is the Lord of all technology, even evil technology. And so it is not a surprise to us that we find as we read the Bible that He uses one of the most evil technologies to accomplish His will. The cross was the reversal of Eden. The cross of Christ was the reversal of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. The curse of Genesis 3 through the misuse of a tree is poetically dealt with by God. God becomes a human like Adam and Eve, and He becomes cursed on what? On a tree. A cross. A Roman technology designed to inflict pain and suffering. God becomes a curse to lift a curse. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God took a ruthless technology, one designed to inflict pain and suffering, the Roman cross of crucifixion. But he used that technology for his purposes to save mankind. He took an evil technology and he turned it around. He also reversed what happened at Genesis chapter 3. The first sin happened with a tree. And the final great act of righteousness happened on what 1 Peter calls a tree. The cross was the reversal of Eden. And it goes further than that. 
further than that. The cross was the reversal of Eden, but Pentecost was the reversal, reversal of Babel. And interestingly, today is, guess what? Pentecost. We are 50 days after Easter. Today is Pentecost, but I want you to think about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Eden started the curse uh, and Babel spread the curse across the world. That mankind was confused, that they were scattered, that they would not be unified, that they would be against God. It spread the curse across the world and the cross lifted the curse. And what happened on Pentecost 50 days later after Christ's resurrection served to spread the good news that the curse had been lifted? Pentecost fixed Babel. At Babel, remember, God was ignored and mankind used technology for prideful evil purposes and God confused their languages. At Pentecost, God made all the, pr- the people present understand His purpose in their own language, and He built His kingdom on His purposes and intentions. Mankind tried to build their own kingdom apart from God, and so their languages were confused. God built His kingdom in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, and He unconfused their languages. They all heard Peter preach in their own language. It is the reversal of Babel. The kingdom. God's technology. If we are truly the people of God, we must use technology in a way that is fit for God's kingdom. Let us be Pentecost people, not Babel people. Let us be people of God's kingdom, not people of the kingdoms of the world. I want to leave you today with three ways that technology, specifically the media that we consume on our phones and tablets and TVs, can quench the fire of God in our families. I'm getting a a lot of this material comes from a book, and I want to recommend this book to you. I know that I recommend books all the time, and I know that some of you aren't readers, and that's fine. And uh, if you want, you can listen to the audio book. There's a good audio book of it. But I highly recommend this book, especially if you have a smartphone, okay? If you have a smartphone, I want you to read this book. It's called 12 Ways Your Smartphone is Changing You, okay? And it doesn't sound like a religious book, but it is probably one of the most Christian books I've ever read in my life. It is filled with scripture from start to finish. Fantastic book. One of the best books I've read. 12 ways your smartphone is changing you. Now, I I would highly recommend that. um, And a lot of of this comes from that. But I want to, I want to finish up today with three ways that technology can be a fire quencher in our families with our kids, with our grandkids, with our our marriages, with our relationships, uh, with us individually. Technology, specifically technology in the form of of things that we consume on our screens, okay? Now, there, there are other, there's, I mean, all kinds of technology out there that's used for good and that's used for bad, but primarily the technology that most affects us today is our computers, our tablets, our phones, those are the, or, and our TVs, those are the ways that technology is really affecting us today. So three things that I want you to take note. This is for husbands and wives. This is for parents. This is for kids. This is for teenagers. I hope this becomes a blessing to you. Number one, technology often distorts right and wrong. Technology often distorts right and and wrong. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul tells his readers, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's the deal. At all times, in every way that you are awake and that you are using your senses as a rational human being, you are either being conformed to this world or transformed to the image of Christ at all times. Your kids at all times are either being conformed to this world or transformed 
to the image of Christ all the time. Those processes do not stop. It's always happening. Everything that we consume, everything that we hear, everything that we look at, everything that that enters into our minds that we experience is either conforming us to this world or transforming us into the image of Christ. It's constantly happening. Technology very often is conforming us to this world. Now, this isn't to say uh, that everything we consume has to have a Christian flavor. I don't, I don't think so. I don't believe that. Most Christian movies are terrible, okay? They're just, they, they're just not good. I mean, I, I, if we're just being honest, uh, there's a lot that are good, but most of them just aren't good. But this does mean that we cannot forget to also do the hard work of renewing our minds toward transformation into God's idea of good. You are constantly being formed. We were over at someone's house the other day, and they were just so sad and depressed about uh, what happened, the school shooting that happened. And I I agree, it is a horrible thing, it's an awful thing. Uh, The the fact that it keeps happening and nothing is changing is a horrible thing, Um, you know, should not be happening. It was a horrible thing. But this person was just so down and so depressed. And they were, you know, my husband is so down, is so depressed. And, 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 and we're there and we're talking. And guess what is on constantly in their house as I'm speaking? Is Fox News 24-7 talking about the shooting. It was constant. They had it on in the background. They leave their TV on at night. It's constant. Friends, we're constantly being molded and shaped by something that enters into our minds and affects our lives. And that does not mean that we uh, just can't watch anything, that we need to become monks and get rid of our TVs and our phones. That's not what that means. What that means, though, is that we need to be intentional about being transformed by the renewal of our minds. Technology often distorts right and wrong. It conforms us to the world rather than being transformed into the image of Christ sometimes. I'm going to say this. And it, it, I'll just say it. Kids who are raised and trained by Disney will not be transformed into Christ's image. Just because it doesn't have cusses in it doesn't mean that it is making our kids be Christian. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with watching Disney but it is not going to raise our children to be like Christ. It's just not. It is not that kind of media. Sure, it doesn't cuss. Oh, great. That's wonderful. But Disney characters are often sassy and overly dramatic and quarrelsome, and we wonder why kids grow up to be sassy and overdramatic and quarrelsome, because they have had that drilled into their minds. Technology often distorts right and wrong. Just because something doesn't cuss doesn't mean that it's a great way to raise our kids. Okay? When, when did Christianity become, well, I just don't want that cussing in it. When did that become Christianity? Like the, like the, the, the height of evil is that it has cusses in it. I don't, you may not feel that way, but I feel like that was like sort of the, the standard of Christianity. Well, can, you, can I consume this? Well, does it have cusses in it? Is that, that's our standard? Let's, let's remember that technology often distorts right and wrong. Once again, not saying that we can't consume these things, but those things that are not specifically Christian are not going to transform us into Christ. So in addition to those things that we're consuming, that we're seeing, that we're watching, that we're listening to, that are not specifically Christian, in addition to those things, we also have to consume things that are Christian. 
technology needs to be utilized in good ways too. And there are wonderful things that we can use. I uh, told someone this week, they asked me a question about uh, something. They had a, a, a person at a different church. They have a VBS coming up, and they're supposed to talk about Jeremiah, and they were looking for resources. And so I gave them some resources, and I told them about the Bible software that I use. And I'm going to pitch this to you because I use it every day, and it is fantastic, and every person in this church needs to use it. It's called Logos Bible Software. And you can buy a package that has about... $1,000 worth of books on it for 50 bucks, And it will give you powerful tools to study God's Word. And you can get it on your phone, and you can get it on your tablet, you can get it on your computer, and I highly recommend it. We need to utilize technology to know right and wrong rather than simply allowing it to distort right and wrong. Number two, technology often tries to replace love. Technology often tries to replace love. Now, more than any time in history, people are replacing relationships that are meant to be in person, committed, and covenant bound with relationships that are primarily experienced through a screen or image. I want you to imagine for a moment that you, the person you are married to, the only way that you can interact with them is through their reflection in a mirror. Okay? I'm, uh, let's say uh, that, that I, I'm married to Kristen, which I am, thankfully, it's so good, okay? And, but let's say that I cannot, I've chosen, rather than to look at her face to face and touch her and hold her hand and have an actual relationship with her, let's say that I have voluntarily chosen to turn my back and only interact with her as I look in a mirror at her reflection, what kind of relationship would that be? It would be a miserable one. Miserable. But in fact, there are people who are looking for love and acceptance and desire through something that is no different, through the screen of a phone or a computer or a tablet. Rather than finding love and acceptance with others, people are looking for likes and upvotes on social media. It's a problem. How many stories have you heard about someone who was bullied on social media and ended up taking their lives because their, their social interactions were all on the internet? Another problem. Rather than finding romantic love with a committed covenant-bound partner, people are trying to fulfill those same desires through a screen. It is more readily available than it ever has been. I want you to listen to this 2018 study. Okay, So this is, three, this is four years old now. We're in 2022, not 2021. This is four years old now. In 2018, a study showed that over 50%, it's probably more than that now, over 50% of teens, that's boys and girls, we're not just counting boys, over 50% of teens, both boys and girls, are viewing porn at least monthly. Over 50%, at least monthly. 51% of male students and 32% of female students first viewed porn before their teenage years. The first exposure to pornography among men is 12 years old on average. And in case you're wondering, my kids, they're not dealing with that. My husband, he's not dealing with that. My wife, she's not dealing with that. 71% of teens hide online behavior from their parents. It's probably much more than that. Never mind the moral issues with this that don't line up to the Scriptures, but just the issue of trying to find love and acceptance and romance 
through someone disconnected through a screen is incredibly harmful to our world, to our young people, to our marriages. Technology often tries to replace love. Love is always primarily face-to-face. I want you to listen to these verses about Jesus and his love for us. 1 John 4, 7-12, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Friends, family, members. God did not love us from a distance from the streets of heaven. He does love us from a distance, but that is not where his love stopped. God came to be among us in the flesh, in person. Love cannot primarily be in a digital space. Love happens between individuals personally, in person, flesh and blood. So technology often distorts right and wrong. Technology often tries to replace love. And technology often destroys contentment. I'm going to ask for a show of hands, okay? And you all usually just sit here and stare at me like there's a gas leak in here, okay? All right? But I'm, but I'm serious. Let me grab my phone. If you have a smartphone today, I want you to get it out. Okay. If you have a dumb phone, you can get it out too if you want to. So you don't feel left out. Okay. How many of you, you don't have to get it out. How many of you have gotten to the point with this thing that it's just natural for you to pull it out and look at it without even thinking about it. Don't, don't deny it. Don't deny it. It happens. It is so ingrained within us that we constantly are just looking at it. In fact, uh, the other day, um, uh, it happened to me. We were, uh, we were, uh, were playing trivia, <laughs> and, uh, and I just got my phone out to start looking at Facebook and then remembered, can't get my phone out. We're playing trivia. And had to put it down. But it was, it was an unconscious thing. Technology often destroys contentment. We have come under the power of technology. And we are not content unless we can use it. Timothy, uh, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. What we want is to be content and to be okay. People who make apps and games and shows and media want you to be addicted to it. It is in its very design. In fact, they design the things you consume to be addicting so that you keep coming back to it. Technology has trained us to not be content unless we are entertained. If you don't believe that, talk to a kid about what the worst thing in the world is. When it all boils down to it, a worst thing to a kid, the worst thing to a kid is being bored. That's it, being bored. That is the worst thing to a young person. Popular comedian Bo Burnham captured this in one of his songs uh, when he says this about the internet. He says, apathy is a tragedy and boredom is a crime. Anything and everything all of the time. That's what our world has come to. We have to constantly be entertained. And it has destroyed our contentment. Our scripture reading from this morning, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, 
All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. The Apostle Paul, almost 2,000 years ago, said this. Technology is lawful for us. It can be a good thing. It can be a great tool. It can be something that we absolutely positively ought to use and use to our advantage. God expected us to. In the beginning, it was a garden. In the end, at the, at the end of the Bible, it's a city. God expects us to build and make and create. Technology is not necessarily a bad thing. But it is not necessarily always helpful. And it will quench the fire that we have for God, the fire that we have for, that husbands have for wives and wives have for husbands, the fire that children have for God, that they have for their parents, the fire that parents have for their children. It will quench that fire very quickly if we let it. We cannot allow ourselves, as Paul says, to be dominated by anything. This Pentecost today, this Pentecost, let us be reminded to put technology back in its proper place. Let us be reminded that Babel, the ultimate expression of mankind using technology to thumb their noses at God, that, that God has reversed that and that He has created His kingdom and that we, as part of God's kingdom, as people who have been raised with Christ, that we have to put it in its proper place. We have dominion over it. It must not have dominion over us. That is when the fire becomes quenched. It must be for God's glory. If you need something today, I don't know, maybe you're addicted to technology, maybe you're addicted to your phone, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you need the prayers of the church, maybe you'd like to have a Bible study, I don't know what you've got going on. We'd love to invite you. We have here what's called an invitation song. Uh, during this song, you can come talk to us about anything that you need. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to help you. Won't you please come as we stand and as we sing?